Hello and welcome to our April Publications podcast. I'm Ed Vital from the University of Leeds and chair of the Lupus Forum. And during this podcast, as always, we're going to discuss the recent lupus articles and what their implications are for clinical practice. So we've got five papers selected by um, the panel this month. And two of those relate to anephrolima. So the first one is this paper by Ian Bruce et al. published in Rheumatology. And actually, this is this is one of the analyses of the pooled data from the anephrolimab tulip one and tulip two studies. But actually, it's not really specifically about that drug. It's actually more about steroids. So we hear all the time now how important it is to keep steroid doses low, taper them down, and every clinical trial now includes steroid tapering as some kind of end point. So we don't really deem drugs to be successful unless they can help patients to come down on steroids. But what does that mean? And, and the reason we try and taper steroids is because that we know that steroids are associated with long-term damage and mortality and infections and things like that. But what does that mean in terms of how people actually feel? And that's what I thought was interesting about this study is it analyzes whether it makes people feel better when the steroids get tapered down. We often, in clinical practice, if patients are complaining of symptoms like fatigue, we sometimes might think, oh, well, some steroids can actually help with that symptom. But the data here kind of show the opposite, that tapering steroids can help with those symptoms. So what they did was they took all the patients who were in TULIP1 and TULIP2, and then you take from that the patients who were on at least 10 milligrams of glucocorticoids, so prednisone or equivalent at baseline, which is about half the cohort, 375 patients. And you can split those into those who got a sustained reduction in glucocorticoids. Sustained reduction means you got down to 7.5 by week 40, and you stayed on less than 7.5 up till week 52. So 155 people got that, and 220 did not get a sustained reduction in glucocorticoids. It was more likely on anifrolumab. Anifrolumab is an effective therapy. So 51% of the patients on anifrolumab achieved this versus only 32% of the patients on placebo. But we already knew that. The point here is something a little bit different, which is that in the people who got the, st the sustained reduction in glucocorticoids, there were various measures that reported these people therefore being more well. So they got improvements in the steroid dose. They got improvements in blood pressure. They also were more likely to have an improvement in facet F. So a, a meaningful response in the facet F was 54% of people who tapered their steroids in a sustained way, compared to only 17% who had them. The SF36 physical components, 52% if you tapered your steroids, 18% if not, and the mental components, 43% of people who tapered the steroids versus only 8% who did not, or almost none. And that's regardless of what, whether you're on anifolumab or placebo, it's just the effect of tapering steroids. So what does this mean? So it, 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 what it can mean is that in people who have pa poor patient reported outcomes, quality of life fatigue, who were on long-term steroids, maybe it could be that actually reducing those steroids and getting them down, and if that means adding other drugs to achieve it, that can actually improve those quality of life symptoms. So it's worth considering. Of course, you have to bear in mind here that the people who got the steroid doses down were probably the ones responding to their treatment, whether it's anifrolimab or the placebo standard of care stuff. So there may be a disease activity difference between these two groups as well. It might not purely be due to the effect of the steroids, but I think that since steroids are well known to have effects on things like mood, weight gain, sleep quality, it's quite plausible that tapering them down could improve quality of life. So the next paper is also about anifrolumab, and this is actually one of mine. This is from my group. This is by Lucy Carter et al, and it's published in the British Journal of Dermatology. So this is something I talk about a lot, which is that one of the observations that first got me interested in lupus was when I was working with rituximab, and I noticed patients 
who will be cell depleted with rituximab. It was given for some other reason, maybe hematological or renal or something. And while they were B cell depleted, they developed new lesions in their skin. And what that told to me was that I, I, I used to think all lupus was sort of hematologically, you know, hematopoietic immune cells attacking tissues um, and B cell mediated. But actually, that showed me that it's not. Um, and we now know that one of the reasons why you get these kinds of lesions in the skin that are resistant to rituximab is because the skin is making loads of interferon. Um, so the tissues themselves can drive lupus-like inflammation and they don't need B cells. But what that means is maybe that's why some patients, particularly some kinds of skin disease, fail an awful lot of therapies. Because a lot of therapies we've used for lupus up to now have all really worked in the same way they all work on adaptive immunity, B cells and T cells. So, you know, azathioprine, mycophenolate, rituximab, bulimumab, they're all trying to do similar jobs of trying to target circulating lymphocytes. So maybe the patients who fail multiple one, multiple of these drugs, it's just the wrong class of therapy for them. And they need, you, and for those people, you need to target the cytokines and the interferons that are coming from their skin. So that's exactly what this is here. So I, I, I took actually the very same patients, all these people I had who'd failed rituximab and they'd mostly failed bulimimab and many other agents, commonly 10, 15 different agents they'd failed in the past. And when I got access to anifrolumab, I did a case series of patients. Well, it was, it was more Lucy Carter's work than mine, I have to say. It. But she did a case series where she took these patients, treated them with anifrolumab, and put them onto very close follow-up. So they got monthly visits, they got photographs, they got Clasi scores, patient reported outcomes, and also biomarkers collected for gene expression, flow cytometry in the blood. Uh, all of these patients have resistant skin disease. Some of them had a bit of arthritis or other lesions as well. Lots of them were on large amounts of steroids. So the main finding is that despite the fact that they've been so resistant these are people I've been following for 15 years, tried everything, so not responding to any of it, they all responded to anaphrolium. So in fact, and they, so they, as soon as they had it, actually responded very fast. So seven out of seven patients responded. Mostly they were in complete remission and mostly they responded within one month. So when they came back for the second infusion, already in remission. Um, so that really shows that these people who fed lots and lots of drugs they haven't really failed lots of drugs. They just failed the same type of therapy that 15 different times, and they actually need to switch to interferon blockade. So um, the other things we've noticed, so one is this is, a, it, anaphrolimab obviously works well as a first line agent. It's great, but it, it is very, it remains a very useful drug, even in your very resistant patients. Um, other things, so uh, the onset's fast, but the other part was that the efficacy was seen across the different types of lesion morphology. So sometimes disc, we thought that with other therapies, discoid lupus has been harder to treat than some other types. But in this case series, we had quite a mixture. So we had some discoid lesions, some ACLE, um, some chillblain and acral lesions. And actually the efficacy appeared similar across all of them, which we, we didn't know that from the trial. So that was a, a nice new piece of information. We've got two abstracts now that are both about some aspects of measuring disease activity in lupus, which is always a, a complex subject, especially with all these clinical trials that we're, we're, we're reviewing on the forum. So this one's about a disease activity measure that we haven't talked about so much. So the most common measures used are the BILAG and the SLEDI and a physician's global index. Um, but this is something called LFA Real. So Lupus Foundation of America, rapid evaluation of activity in lupus. And the concept here is a bit different. It's, an, it's a neat concept, which is to say that with, with things like the SLEDI and the BILAG, you, you have glossary definitions of exactly what counts. So what counts as arthritis, what counts as rash, when's it severe, when's it moderate, etc. There are criteria and rules about this, which tries to make people score things in the same way. But those, those 
criteria and philosophy definitions and rules can cause their own problems because firstly it's easy to make mistakes um because it's quite complicated so it's a bit hard to learn it's a bit hard to follow and also there may be things that you're noticing as a doctor that count as severity that aren't really captured in the glossary you see it lots of times if you use this where you think well i think that person's quite severe but that doesn't really be seem to be reflected take the skin patients i was just talking about a patient who has very severe discoid lesion on the face this is scarring it's very visible it has a massive effect on the quality of life um and it's very difficult to treat so there's lots of things about that that I, both the doctor and the patient would say were severe. But on the sleeve eye, that's only two points. And even when you take the biolag to get highest score on biolag, you need large amounts of body surface area covered. Classic. So what they did in the, in the LFA reel was they just said lots of visual analog scores for each part of the body. So for example, for a rash, you just have a VAS zero to three, and you can put the line where you want. So it's very intuitive, doesn't need much training. You just, and you go through different parts of the body. So the cl clinician will score overall, the skin, neurological, MSK, cardiorespiratory, renal, hematology. Um, so you go down and each of those, you just put your own personal rating of where you feel they are. And then the other unique thing is that the patient does it too. It seems simple, seems quite intuitive, easily to learn perhaps allows you to put what you really feel about that patient, even if that differs from the glossary. The problem with these, with new outcome measures, is always how do you know whether it's doing a better job than the old one? If the different outcome measures are giving different answers, how do you know which one's right? And so I think this is a relatively new outcome measure. There's still a bit of tweaking and adjustment going on. And so this was a study to try and compare it to the others. So here, they took some data from a trial. So this is the trial of a drug that was finished a while ago, and in fact, not a completed trial. So they had 516 patients who'd been scored for the clinical part of the LFA reel, and then the, the patient's own part. So the patient does their own set of visual analog scores as well. So you've got the clinical part of the LFA reel, the patient part of the LFA reel, and the biolag, and the sleeve eye, and the joint counts in the class. And essentially, how do these all relate to each other? So look for correlations. Because what you'd expect, since these things are all trying to measure the same thing, that the person who scores the highest on the LFA reel will also score the highest on the biolag analysis or the highest on the leader. Actually, the correlations between most of these measures were only moderate. So in other words, they did yes, they correlated. Um, there was some relationship but there weren't very strong correlations, which does raise a lot of questions because that means, so they didn't exactly rate people in the same way, which means why were they different? And also that we still don't know which is the right answer. Is the, is the best answer the person scores highest on the LFA rail or the best answer the person scores highest on the biolab? We don't, so there's unanswered questions there. But there, there is some agreement, but also a significant amount of disagreement. The other thing, that's reported in this paper is that for some parts of these outcome measures, the agreement was better. So for all the different things that were to do with skin, like Clasi and parts of the LFA reel, those correlated more strongly. And things related to the joints, like the LFA reel, MSK part, and the joint counts, those correlated more strongly. But the other organs and parts of the lupus were, co were correlating a little less well. So I think we still, you know, the, the subject of um, outcome measures in the lupus will continue to require lots of work until we really get it right or get it as good as we can. In terms of what this means for practice, so I think what we could say is because it, it does seem like scoring the skin and the joints is a, a, a bit better across all these instruments. They agree with each other more. They probably do a better job. So... When you when seeing a patient, it's important to remember that the other organs are harder to document how active they are. So you probably need more detailed and descriptive notes to say what's going on in other organs because outcome measures can't do the job so well. Also have to bear in mind, most data from trials in non-renal lupus is all about skin and joint disease because we know how to measure it and there's lots of it about. And so the evidence, the strength of evidence for these new treatments that comes from these trials when it applies to other organs is not always as strong, and that's important to remember.
Okay, so this is one more about measuring disease activity, and this is about something called DORIS. DORIS is definition of remission in SLE. So in other words, this is how we, we can take disease activity scores like the SLE die um, or the BIOLAG or whatever, um, but what, do we, what does it take to say somebody's in remission? And this was agreed some years ago um, by uh, a group led by Andrea Doria and the they agreed the definition of remission is that the clinical SLE die is zero. Clinical SLE die, because the SLE die has got two points for DNA antibodies and two points for complement. And we don't want to say somebody's active because they only have abnormal blood tests when they don't have symptoms and signs. So we ignore those parts of the clinical SLE die. The clinical SLE die is just symptoms and signs that matter. So clinical SLE die needs to be zero. The physician's global, that zero to Free scale needs to be less than 0.5 and they have to be on less than and they have to be on no more than five milligrams of prednisolone per day and their immunosuppressants have to be stable so you need all of that to be remission. you can't just have no symptoms and signs because you're taking a lot of steroids um so the idea here was quite simple which is they took 508 patients and they had data to say were they in Doris remission by those criteria that I just said. But they also simply asked the doctor seeing the patient, don't look at the sleeve die, just in your opinion, is this person in remission? So what, oh, uh, or is this person in remission or is this person something called serologically active clinically quiescent? So again, that's that concept that if they've got no symptoms and signs, but the double-stranded DNA antibody is up, that, that can be called, that's called serologically active clinically quest. And we'll count that like remission too. So of the 508 people, 54% were in Doris remission. So in other words, Doris remission is achievable in normal practice. 56% were in remission or serologically active clinically quiescent, according to the doctor's own judgment. So there was 81% agreement, which is quite good, but where was the disagreement? So of 46 people who were in remission, according to the physician, but didn't fulfill the criteria for Doris. For the, of those, 39, it was because they had a clinical sleep diet of more than zero. Five people, it was because the physician's global assessment was more than 0.5. And five people, it was because they were on fitness alone of more than five. So what I think what, what they're getting at here, the authors, is that if you ask doctors to just decide when they think things are okay and somebody's in remission, we may have a tendency to be too lenient. So we might have a tendency to call someone remission when actually then they really they have got a bit of disease activity or really their steroid dose is a bit higher than it should be. And so their suggestion is that if you're doing treat target approaches, you should kind of go down that approach where you say that if the person doesn't meet the criteria of Doris remission, then therapy should be changed. And it's not, you know, in, in other words, set your own judgment aside and do it by the criteria, maybe a better approach. That's that's the suggestion here. I personally, I think, you know, the, 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 I think the only questions in my head about that is that having a clinical SLE die of more than zero, you know, you sometimes see people where they've got a few points on the SLE die, someone scored it, and I don't 100% agree that it's active disease. Something like alopecia or malthosis can easily be scored when they're not really due to lupus. So it's just possible that that's another explanation here, that actually the physician judgment may have some advantages over just what the sleeve I said. And our last paper is about real-world data on lupus nephritis. This is from a group from Taiwan by Liao et al, published in Journal of Rheumatology. And again, this is, this is a simple concept that is easy to see the clinical relevance. Because what they said here is that when we, when, we, when we have new patients with lupus nephritis, we do a biopsy at baseline. We use the biopsy to help guide our treatment decisions. Is it class one, two, three, four, five? 
what what immunosuppressants are we going to use how how severe does it look how aggressive do we feel like we need to be based on the biopsy and of course the biopsy is really important if after six months or 12 months you're not sure the patient's doing very well and you need to do another biopsy that you've got some sort of a baseline so what they did here is they got 537 patients who'd had a renal biopsy over a 13-year period from 2006 to 2019. They got data on all the different histological features on the biopsy in great detail. So it's not just class two, class three, they went into more, you know, more specific features that were reported on the biopsy. And then they looked at the long-term follow-up of those patients over a median follow-up of 7.5 years. So over that time, 58 of their patients had got kidney failure and 64 patients had died. So then they went and looked at which of the features on the histology were most predictive of those outcomes. Now, obviously, um, if you've got a severe nephritis, then you'll have many, many different things that are all severe at once. And if you've got a mild, you'll have many things that are all mild at once. So on the on a univariable analysis, as in taking these features one by one, there were lots and lots of them that were more severe in the patients who got kidney failure or who died. But then they did a multivariable analysis to try and work out of those which ones were, you know, which ones were just correlating with each other and which ones were the true independent predictors. And the answer they reported was that the, the two most important predictors of kidney failure were tubular atrophy and tubular interstitial inflammation, which might not have been the first thing everyone thought, actually. It's, just, it's an interesting and important point. There were a couple of other things that were a bit less clear. I'm not 100% sure whether what I think of them, but there was cellular crescents were only predictive in men and fibrous crescents were only predictive in women. That's an, an odd result, that part. I don't know quite what to think about that, that part of it. But I think the general message is that when you look at a kidney biopsy, you look for tubular atrophy and look for tubular interstitial inflammation. And if those are present, if your patient's got a higher risk of kidney failure, and that means that you need to do all the things that we know that are important to maintain a good outcome. So you need to be more careful with your choice of immunosuppressants. You need to be more careful with the adjunct therapies. And as we increasingly recognize to get the best outcomes in lupus nephritis, it's not just about which drugs we use. It's also about the, from the patient, what's their adherence like and how do you, and, and can you ensure that their adherence is high? And from the doctor's side, the quality of care delivery, how frequently they're seen, are they seen in combined clinics with rheumatologists, nephrologists, et cetera. All those things need to be really tight. So that's the end of the uh, po podcast for this month. And thank you as always for listening. Uh, these papers uh, are all available on the Lupus Forum on lupus-forum.com. So you can download the PowerPoint set that I've just been going through. The Bruce, Carter, Askenazi and Gonzalez papers are all available as full slide sets. And the Liao paper is a single slide summary in our literature highlights. And don't forget to register for updates on the Lupus Forum. If you do that, you'll get regular emails when new content's available. And you can also keep track on things by following us on Lupus Forum or one word on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Thanks again and see you next time.